Uh, welcome to uh, today's lecture. <clears throat> infectious diseases, and I've got a cold at the moment, infectious diseases has really highlighted the inequality in healthcare provision across the world, and, uh, and very sadly also in Australia because our Indigenous uh, population actually has a disproportionate amount of infectious diseases, particularly um, group A streptococcal infection and, uh, and rheumatic heart disease. So it's a, a really great pleasure to have uh, Sir Gus Nossel give today's lecture. Um, among Gus's many, many, many accolades, pre being director of WEHI, during the time at WEHI, and then after WEHI, is, uh, is the insights that he's gained actually being chair of the World Health Organization program on vaccine and biologicals. And also he's uh, chair on the strategic advisory um, panel of the children's vaccine program of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And he's also um, had the insight from being the deputy chair of the um, Indigenous um, Aboriginal Reconciliation Process and uh, the chair of the strategic advisory committee on the Global Foundation. So I'm sure he'll share all those insights. He's very eminently placed to actually give today's lecture. So thank you very much, Gus. Thank you very much, Mark. And, uh, Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good to see you all here on this important subject. Uh, I've got uh, a message of great urgency for you. I've also got a fairly considerable measure of hope. And I think the quickest way of coming to grips with the uh, tremendous inequities is simply to look at some regular mortality statistics. And as we go through these next five or six slides, I'd like you to remember that two-thirds of the premature deaths are preventable, that infectious causes still dominate in the developing countries, with in order pneumonia, diarrhoea, malaria, tuberculosis and measles exercising the worst toll, and of course immunology, particularly vaccines, also monoclonal antibodies, can really help. Now, let's look at the simplest of the statistics, life expectancy, I've pooled men and women, and look how wonderfully medical science has helped this situation in the last 50 years in the industrialised countries. On average, about a 10-year prolongation of the lifespan. That's not due to sanitation, that's really basically medical science. Uh, the sanitation boosts and so forth were in the previous half century and would have totaled pretty close to 20 years. But look at what some of the worst of the developing countries are facing. In Zambia, the uh, life expectancy has gone down. In Angola, which is the lowest life expectancy in the world, it's 38 years. So if we now compare the worst country to the best country, we note that at birth, a child born in Angola has 46% of the lifespan of a child born in Australia or Japan. Now, a widely used measure of the overall efficacy of a health system is deaths under five years per thousand live births. You'll see that quoted a lot. And again, look at the tremendous movement uh, in the industrialised countries over the last 50 years, so that really deaths under five are now quite uncommon. Whereas in the developing countries, the situation is much more dire. India, comparatively speaking, has done pretty well, but still has 30 deaths per thousand live births. So now if we compare the worst with the best, we have, wait for it, a 78-year-old difference. There are 78 times bigger chance of that beautiful little baby dying in the first five years than if you lived in Australia, Japan, USA, etc. Again, pneumonia, diarrhea, malaria. But my message of hope stems from that second last line. If you look at the world improvement, total world improvement uh, over the last decade, there's a 2.8% compound fall in the total number of deaths, even though the population is still rising. We'll see that more clearly on this slide, where 
from 1960, 20 million child deaths to, at the moment, something under eight. And what I've done here is I've projected the trend, if we can keep up the foreign aid effort, if we can keep up the collaboration with the developing countries, uh, versus what if we do nothing more, and that's that little blue triangle. Well, within that little blue triangle, out to 2025, there are 27 million child deaths that could be prevented by very simple means. Vaccines, malaria prevention and treatment, diarrhea and pneumonia treatment and control, and good newborn practices. So that is genuinely a message of hope. Now, perhaps the worst statistic of all, and this is the last one in this series of slides, is deaths in childbirth, maternal deaths due to pregnancy and childbirth. You'll see in the industrialised countries, when now the metric is per 100,000 live births, the deaths are very rare. And in fact, if you look in a country like Australia, five deaths per 100,000 live births, almost all of those are due to some profound and bad disease that the woman had when she fell pregnant, and they are not in the strictest of senses obstetric deaths. Uh, most of them are not. So in other words, for your wife to go and die in childbirth if she is healthy is almost unknown in Australia. And look at these shocking figures in the developing countries. So if we now compare the worst to the best, we have a 400-fold difference, 400-fold difference uh, between the <coughs> best and the worst. And in this case, the last 20 years of improvement are only at a compound 1.4% per annum. Now, aid plays a big role in this situation, particularly aid that relates to things like vaccines and antibiotics and antiretroviral treatment for <coughs> AIDS and so forth. Lester Pearson in 1970, the then Prime Minister of Canada, persuaded the United Nations itself to adopt the mandate that 0.7% of gross national income should go to aid. But as we sit here, only five countries have reached this goal. And in fact, the global total is 0.31% of gross national income, or about $130 billion. Now, that's aid overall. That's the totality of bilateral and multilateral aid. Health, depending on the country, gets from 7 to 15% of this. Well, who are the good guys? Uh, the Nordics are amazing, uh, and the Netherlands is pretty good. There are five countries that have reached uh, overseas development assistance as a percent of gross national income above 0.7. UK is pretty good. There was a very interesting thing that Cameron did in his first budget. And as you know, things are tough in the UK. But in a very, very tough budget, the only two things that were not cut were the National Health Scheme, of which, of course, Britain is justly very, very proud, and foreign aid. USA is low in percentage, although, of course, you've got to recognise that it's the highest in volume terms because of their large... Uh, national income. And Australia sits roughly in the middle of the pack at 0.35% of GDP. It's currently 5 billion. The AusAid budget is one of the few budgets of any government department that is actually rising. And we are supposed to be going bipartisan policy, bipartisan agreement to 0.5% of gross national income by 2016-17. It was 2015. And the last budget, they slipped it back a year. I'm not going to die in a ditch over that, but it's very important that we keep the pollies to the pledges as they sit here. Now, I'm going to begin with polio, because all of you, even David Tarleton, is too young to remember what it was like when we had polio epidemics in this country. But I remember very well when there was a big epidemic on, our mothers would not let us go to the swimming pool or to the movies of a Saturday afternoon for fear of catching polio. And the wards of a hospital like the Fairfield Infectious Diseases Hospital were full of people with bulbar polio. 
lying there in respirators, spending the rest of their days in a respirator because their respiratory muscles have become paralysed. Well, as I say, that's just a distant memory to you. That, to you, that's an old person talking about things that have no possible significance to you. But in point of fact, global polio eradication isn't quite there yet. And this wonderful program is a partnership between Rotary International, the World Health Organization, and UNICEF. And I did want to go over some of the key strategies with you because they're clever. First of all, Sabin vaccine rather than SOC, the live attenuated oral drops rather than the injectable uh, uh, polio vaccine of SOC, well, it killed whole virus particles as SOC. Uh, and that's for two reasons. First of all, drops are much easier to administer if you've got to give it to a lot of babies. And secondly, um, it's quite a bit cheaper because there are fewer virions involved if you're using a live attenuated than if you're using a killed. You, of course, have to try, this is a somewhat pious hope, to have a high routine infant coverage with their uh, normal immunisation schedules like the diphtheria, whooping cough, tetanus and so forth, also polio. Give them, try to achieve a high routine coverage. But the real breakthrough, which in fact was pioneered in Latin America, and Latin America has been polio free for a good many years, were these NIDs the National Immunisation Days. What is a National Immunisation Day? It's a situation where through a huge social mobilisation effort, frequently involving the head of state or the first lady, and getting a lot of uh, publicity from the faith groups and from the media and from the newspapers, all the kids under five, all the kids, regardless of previous immunisation history, are lined up and given the drops largely by volunteer labour. Rotary has been absolutely marvellous in that regard. And it doesn't really matter if the kid has had the Sabin before, they get it again, because that's the easiest way to catch kids whose parents are simply too useless to take them to the uh, child health clinics for their 6, 10 and, 16, uh, 6, 10 and 14 weeks routine immunisations. Now, you've got to have surveillance. You've got to know what your enemy is and quantitatively how much of it there is. And of course, you have to have laboratory confirmation of polio because there are other causes of acute flaccid paralysis. And if there is a little outbreak, particularly towards the end game in a particular country, you've got to mobilise your forces to have prompt outbreak control with two doses of oral polio vaccine two weeks apart around the particular index case. And they'll do that quite widely. I mean, that can involve hundreds of thousands of doses. You spot the little case in this tiny village here, come in with your vaccination team, immunise all the kids. Well, the result has been that the polio cases have been reduced by 99%, and to date in 2012, would you believe, only 103 cases. They are confined to four countries. Three countries, Nigeria, Pakistan and Afghanistan, where the virus uh, has, where transmission has never been interrupted. And one country, Chad, which had previously been declared to be polio free, but where there is renewed transmission, although not in very large numbers. And four of those five kids that have had the polio this year have been nomads. You can imagine that a, a television campaign, a radio campaign, will be a little bit more difficult to achieve for a nomadic kid than for one settled in a, in a village or a town. Now, the companies have been good, and they're now quite many of them are companies in developing countries. The cost, the average cost of a polio drop is now only 13 cents. But the program as a whole is very expensive because there's 1.4 million paid vaccinators of 20 million volunteer workers who do have to be coordinated. There are 146 laboratories who study 96,000 cases of acute flux paralysis, 200,000 stool samples. And as you're going on, country by country, there's a total of 400 million kids immunised each year. 
That adds up to a big bill. And the social mobilisation and communication costs are just that alone, around $100 million a year. So the total cost of the program, shocking though it may be to realise it, is a billion a year, and the total expenditure since 1988 is $9 billion. For what it's worth, economists always love to calculate these things. Someone has said that the economic benefits of final eradication might be 40 to $50 billion. Now, once it's gone, it's not all over Red Rover. You've got a few worries still. You certainly have to maintain good surveillance for a few more years. You have to have an international stockpile of oral polio vaccine in case you goofed, and there are some cases that you weren't going to expect. And that is believed to be best to be a monovalent stockpile for polio 1, 2, and 3, because, of course, if it's an outbreak, it's going to be one of those three strains, uh, and uh, you're better off with a monovalent vaccine. Three years after global disappearance, WHO suggests you simultaneously cease immunisation over the whole world. Residual risks include prolonged excretion of vaccine-derived polio by persons with severe primary immunodeficiency. That could go on for years. Accidental release from a manufacturing site or research facility. Remember that after smallpox was eradicated, a laboratory in Scotland uh, had an accidental uh, release of smallpox with 32 cases and three or four deaths, and then a further death as the head of the lab committed suicide. That's how badly he felt about it. So that's important. And of course, if there is a vaccine-derived virus that mutates back to virulence, it could cause a mini outbreak, which you have to be very guarded against. A big deal will be to try to contain the virus stocks to the minimum number of laboratories. Some people say maybe we need a round of SOC, a round of IPV globally. Others say that probably is not cost effective in a low resource country. And sadly, we're probably going to have to spend 200, 250 million per year for some years after it's gone. Now let's speak about HIV AIDS. Well, the global fight against AIDS is funded by two main sources. The so-called Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB and Malaria, which is a UN-backed public sector-private sector partnership launched in 2002, and PEPFAR, probably the smartest thing that George W. Bush ever did, the President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, which is USA-funded and coordinated, and that was launched in 2003. There's a little anecdote and a rumour, I suppose, that says it was really the speechwriter who wrote it into the uh, State of the Union speech, thought it was a good idea, or someone had got to him, stick in $10 billion for AIDS. Uh, Bush read it and said, yeah, I think we can do that. In it went. And yes, the Congress approved, and so initially uh, PEPFAR was launched with $3 billion a year. Anyhow, these two, the Global Fund were here last week, as a matter of fact, and gave a number of seminars. Uh, and believe it or not, the two programs do apparently work very closely together, even though they're independently funded initiatives. They're in 151 low- and middle-income countries, uh, and the amazing sum of $9 billion is being spent largely on antiretroviral therapy. There's over 8 million people now on the drugs. There's a cumulative 1.5 million pregnant women who have been treated to prevent mother-to-child transmission, a very cost-effective health intervention. And all over the world, about 12 million people living with HIV are being cared for uh, by these two programs, including 5 million orphans and other vulnerable children. The program is getting traction. It looks as though the pandemic has peaked, with 2.3 million deaths in 2005, 1.7 million deaths last year. But there are 34 million people living with HIV. At least 15 million people need antiretrovirals. As I've said, 8 million are getting it. One million people start antiretrovirals each year, but two million each year are newly infected. 
So, you know, you're chasing your tail a little bit. There's a long distance to go. Now, here is some very good news. Antiretrovirals cut transmission between discordant couples where one is HIV positive and the other is HIV negative by a full 96%. Why is that? Well, it is because the antiretrovirals drive the virus load in the blood down so low that they often drive to undetectable levels. And of course, that's different from carrying 20,000 variants per a milliliter of blood or semen, uh, uh, as opposed to less than 10. So that's good news. And the other good news is, once again, the companies are behaving. The price of a year's treatment with the cheapest uh, triple drug combination, some of the fancier ones with four drugs, cost more, uh, down from uh, 10,000 bucks for a year's treatment uh, in 2000 to 100 bucks in 2012. That is actually, I think that's a pretty remarkable statistic. Now, these newer findings about the uh, eff efficacy of antiretrovirals <coughs> have prompted some new recommendations and have created for us some new puzzles. It's now suggested that you do give art prophylactically to the HIV-positive partner in a discordant couple, whether or not the person's immune system is failing. Today, we give antiretrovirals when the CD4 T-cell count is 350 or less. Should we be giving it earlier? Should we, in fact, start antiretrovirals as soon as seroconversion has been documented? Well, there's some pros, much reduced transmission. There's also some cons. Possible earlier drug resistance, of course, much higher costs. And side effects. I mean, ponder a 24-year-old bloke, seroconverting is going to be on antiretrovirals for 60 years. Not that comfortable to contemplate. And the world at the moment is... Um, divided about this. There seemed to be a groundswell in the last AIDS Congress for earlier treatment, but there are many people who say, uh, really don't even talk about it, till that 7 million people who have reached the 350 or less threshold and are not getting the drugs until they're covered. It's, not, it's obscene to talk about giving to perfectly healthy people. So opinion is divided. And it is believed that uh, the cost-benefit equation of this will be positive with much more productive work, less hospitalisation, fewer orphans, etc. Well, what about vaccines? Huge disappointment as trial after trial, and that's, this goes back damn close to 20 years, failed. But a little tiny thread of hope in 2009, when Sanofi Pasteur's so-called RV144 vaccine gave a pathetic, but nevertheless just statistically significant, 31.2% protection in uh, Thai volunteers, all male volunteers. And this was a so-called prime boost vaccine. There was a canary pox virus vector carrying three HIV genes, and it was followed by a booster of the straight GP120 protein from the envelope. Interestingly, the RV144 did not lower the virus set point. That's the level of virus achieved in the stable phase. That's bad news. Analysis of the results suggested that uh, IgG antibodies against the V1, V2 region might be protective. Curiously and quite surprisingly, High IGA, antib IGA antibodies were slightly harmful. No one understands that. And this is, of course, non-neutralizing antibodies, so antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity is one possibility. Anyhow, what's the world doing about this pathetic result of 31%? Well, you've got to do something. You can't just let it sit there. So what the world has decided to do is P5, this is a partnership between the Gates, uh, two companies, and uh, CDC and WHO. And it meant brokering peace between two huge rivals, 
Sanofi Pasteur and Novartis, both European companies. Now they're going to work together because Novartis has got a good, safe adjuvant called MF59. And believe it or not, the modest aim of this thing is 50% protection rather than 31%. And wait for it. If it's successful in the phase three, which will start in 2016, you won't have a vaccine until 2019. Now, aren't these sobering facts? You think no one's doing anything. You say, why the hell haven't we got an AIDS vaccine? Here's the reason you haven't got an AIDS vaccine. These clinical trials are incredibly tedious, expensive, difficult, frustrating. There are many other clinical trials I've just listed. Three there to watch. One of them is a sock-like vaccine, the Canadian one, which has simply killed HIV particles that have been genetically crippled to, even if you hadn't killed them, they're, no, they're not, no longer going to kill you. And the other two are prime boost. Now, interestingly enough, after the world had given up on antibodies and have said we need a T-cell vaccine, the antibodies are making a bit of a comeback. Yes, B-cells are still in favour. How come? Well, it's turned out that if you wait long enough, maybe three, three and a half years, uh, up to a quarter of HIV-positive uh, individuals eventually make antibodies that will be broadly neutralising. And monoclonal antibodies can be derived from B cells of these subjects, including from mucosal B cells. And quite a lot of distinct conserved across the strains, conserved across the strains binding sites on the envelope have been found. Uh, of course, the CD4 binding site, uh, V2 and V3 loops of GP120, particularly in the V3 crown, where there are a lot of conserved residues. Glycans, um, sites which only appear on the trimeric form of ENV, which is in the viral spikes, you know, they come up as trimers. Simple molecule of GP120 uh, or GP41 doesn't have it. But the trimeric form has a site. Uh, and the membrane proximal external region. And there's a special class of conserved sites, which are the so-called CD4-induced epitopes, because when the um, ENV binds initially to CD4, it undergoes quite a profound allosteric change, and it reveals for the first time the co-receptor binding site. Now, if you can freeze that moment in time, it's a very, very brief moment in time, you might be able to create a vaccine that makes antibodies to that stressed state. And the most far advanced of that is George Lewis's work at, in Bob Gallo's lab, uh, which is a um, single-chain GP120 CD4 complex, which seeks to reveal and mimic that site. And out lots of clever strategies, including lots of mathematical and computer modelling uh, and lots of uh, creation of 3D structures that you look at in X-ray crystallography and so forth, are trying to find uh, <coughs> antigens which will uh, be against these conserved sites, uh, which will make antibodies against these conserved sites. Now... Is this a wise thing? The NIH has started clinical trials of passive immunisation. I think they're mainly doing it just to see if it works, because I cannot imagine that someone would get an injection of a monoclonal antibody every three weeks just so they can have unprotected sex. I mean, that seems a bit bizarre. But in any case, clinical trials of passive immunisation have be begun at the NIH. First one is an antibody against the CD4 binding site. It's not a bad place to begin. Now, let's say a few words about malaria. The Global Malaria Action Plan was endorsed by the UN in 2008. It set itself a rather over-ambitious goal of eliminating malaria deaths by 2015. Of course, that won't happen. It was too ambitious. 
But the situation is improving, and uh, you've often seen slides which say a, a million malaria deaths per year. Well, it looks as though they're down to 650,000, but half the world's population is still at risk. Vector control is, of course, an exceedingly important uh, <coughs> method, and the insecticide-treated bed nets have been wonderfully, wonderfully helpful. Coated with either pyrethroids or, yes, believe it or not, DDT, still an excellent, <laughs> an excellent uh, treatment, uh, and they have been uh, spread widely around the world. They reckon 700 million uh, will be distributed in the next few years at a cost of five bucks per net and five bucks to get the net to where they need to go. So very cost effective. Research is bringing forward both new chemo repellents for personal use and chemo attractants to trap the mosquitoes in various traps. The best single drug is 2,000 years old. It comes from the sweet wormwood uh, tree. It was used by the Chinese uh, 2,000 years ago as a tea. And the Chinese themselves purified and isolated artemisinin. It is by far the best single drug. But you must not use it as a single drug. You must use it as artemisinin combination therapy with two other drugs to delay the emergence of resistance. At least 300 million people have benefited from this through the Global Fund. And two sorts of prophylactic therapy are starting to be used on a population-wide basis, so-called IPT, intermittent prophylactic therapy. Recommended for all pregnant women, one dose in the second trimester, one dose in the third trimester, using sulfadoxine pyrimethamine. Also three doses for infants along the routine immunisation times. And for the worst areas of sub-Saharan Africa, there's seasonal malaria chemo prevention with um, amodiaquine plus sulfadoxine pyrimethamine monthly for all children under five during the high transmission season. See, we're getting aggressive. We're getting on the front foot. These drugs are still good. And if you can, of course, uh, prevent the malaria, you're not only doing good to that kid, you're also making it more difficult for the mosquito to spread the disease around. Malaria vaccines, the furthest advanced candidate is RTSS from GlaxoSmithKline. That is a circumspirozoite antigen with uh, at least four different principles of adventicity, very, very important. Uh, the phase three trials come down next year. It's looking as though you'll get about 50% protection. But that's so far only in 7 to 18-month-old infants. As results for the 6 to 12-week-old infants come down later this year. And several other malaria vaccines are in phase 1 or 2A trials. I'm not going to go through these in a great deal of detail because we're running a bit short of time. Only to say that Prime Boost here raised its head the common cold virus, the adenovirus, works very well as a vector, but you want one against which you haven't got pre-existing antibodies, strains like AD35 and AD26. And, of course, if you want to go after the traveller's market, which might make the whole thing financially viable, the traveller's market and the armed forces market, you also need a vaccine against Vivax. Falciparum's the killer, but Vivax is a nasty disease. And uh, so someone is doing the circumspirozoite antigen of Vivax. And then lastly, the unselfish vaccine, the vaccine that's found on the surface of the uh, sexual stages, which uh, in the blood of the human and carried by the mosquito, in, uh, by the mosquito uh, when it takes a meal, if you have antibodies against those, the, um, <coughs> the uh, falciparum can't divide in, in the mosquito, can't reach the salivary glands. You will not do anything to the person getting it, but you'll have a transmission-lowering vaccine. And that's a pretty good strategy. I hope eventually the definitive malaria vaccine will have all of these. TB. The Stop TB Partnership, would you believe, 
has a thousand partners. Yes, there are a lot of voluntary bodies working in TV. A lot. It's hosted by WHO. It apparently works pretty well in terms of collaboration. And the aim is to bring the deaths down by 50% from the 2001 level by 2012 and the global incidence to less than one case per million by 2050. That's reasonably close to eradication. But today there are 8.8 .8 million new active cases per year and one million of these also have HIV. So you can imagine what a combination that is. HIV destroying the immune system, it's the immune system only, which keeps the Mantu positive person free of tuberculosis. About a third of the world has tuberculosis in some little apical region of the lung. Take away the T cells and the macrophages, that, that TB will burst out. The key to stopping TB is DOTS, directly observable treatment short term, short term being six months, not so short in my book, and it's a cocktail of four antimicrobial drugs. 46 million people have been treated with DOT, 7 million lives saved. Where is our emphasis today? Well, of course, on TB plus HIV, and of course, on multi-drug resistance TB and extreme drug resistance TB. Multi-drug resistance means resistant to the first-line drugs, the cheap drugs, isoniazid, rifampicin. Extreme drug resistant is resistance to those two, also to the fluoroquinolones, and to at least one of the in-reserve, toxic, expensive, injectable drugs. Uh, Multi-drug resistance now accounts for 3% of all new TB cases, and 9% of these are extreme drug resistance. So it's still rare, it's still only a fraction of a percent, but it is present in 77 countries. This is a real threat. We don't want to run out of drugs. Uh, but research goes on. There is a, uh, a new combination, the first new combination for years and years and years, NC001, which is a new combination of a novel TB candidate, an antibiotic not yet approved for TB, and then one of the classical TB drugs. It's been shown to kill 99% of the bugs within two weeks, and the first trial cuts down the six months of the dots to four months, and the next trial, NC002, will be a two-month course. Now, that would make a big difference if we go down from a six-month course to a two-month course, particularly as regards compliance. Tuberculosis vaccines, there are fully 12 in clinical trials. Uh, again, the um, uh, prime boost is to the four. Uh, there's a very good one uh, that... Uh, uses modified vaccinia ankara as a vector and the prominent TB antigen 85A. And yes, there is a subunit vaccine, GlaxoSmithKline's M72, which is a fusion protein of two prominent TB antigens, again using their proprietary adjuvant with these strong adjuvant properties. And uh, the Max Planck Institute, this is Stefan Kaufmann in Berlin, has a very clever strategy He's got a safer and enhanced MCG with a listeriolysin gene insert. You know, as the BCG enters the macrophage, it immediately goes into a lysosome, into a phagolysosome. And it's inside there and it's trapped. But really, you want this antigen to stream out and to stream out into the body. So listeriolysin uh, ruptures the uh, wall of the vesicle in which the BCG is entrapped and gives, hopefully, a stronger stimulus. Quite a clever idea. That's in clinical trial. Now, as regards the older vaccines, the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunization has been a wonderful success. I feel proud about this because I did a lot of work on this in the 1990s. And they have just had a very successful pledging meeting in London where another $4.2 billion was raised for Gavi. 326 million children immunised that wouldn't have been immunised without it. The coverage is now around about 82% in the 72 poorest countries of the world. One of the tricks has been to use a pentavalent vaccine, which is diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, hepatitis B, 
and Haemophilus influenza B, a cause of meningitis and pneumonia. That saves a lot of needle pricks. I mean, it's difficult to ask a mum to come back and back and back and get yet more needles. Uh, and they're ro rolling out uh, pneumococcal vaccines, rotavirus, human papilloma virus, hooray for Ian Fraser, and rubella to prevent uh, the rubella disease of, of the fetus. Its budget is about 1.2 billion per year. It really needs to rise, and there are still 19 million chief children unimmunized each year. Now, there are little triumphs. I had the great good fortune of starting this program in uh, 1998 as a collaboration between the non-governmental organization PATH and the uh, World Health Organization, funded by Gates, $70 million grant, uh, to try and get rid of the uh, epidemic uh, Neisseria meningitis sera group A, which is running through, rampaging through, the so-called meningitis belt of sub-Saharan Africa, which runs from Senegal to Ethiopia and contains 300 million people. When those epidemics are on, not only are they terrifying, and you all know about meninge, how you can go from being perfectly well to being dead in two days, how you can lose digits and limbs, and you know it's a really horrible disease. Uh, because when it's on, it absolutely paralyzes the health system of these countries. You know, health officials think about nothing else but trying to control these epidemics. Well, a competition was held as to who would win the 70 million. Only two of the big five vaccine manufacturers from the rich countries put up their hands. Quite a few from the developing countries did. Both of the rich country people said, we can make this vaccine for you for two bucks a dose. Guess what? The Serum Institute of India said 50 cents a dose. So did a couple of other third world manufacturers. And indeed, it's going to come in at 40-something cents per dose. Uh, they did all of the development work. They had a lot of technology transfer in the conjugation technologies from the richer countries, and quite appropriately so. The vaccine was licensed in 2009 and has been progressively rolled out. And it's absolutely dramatically, as you would expect, with TB collaboration, T-cell, B-cell collaboration, dramatically better than the carbohydrate vaccine which preceded it. In 2011, uh, Burkina Faso, which was the kind of demonstration country, had just four cases. They had sort of something like a 90% coverage of the population. They had four cases in 2011. Every single one was in an unimmunized individual. So the vaccine is good. It works. And it's so far reached 55 million people. It'll be available in all 25 countries by 2016 at this very reasonable price. Now, we've spoken a lot about vaccines. My last substantive slide wants to tell you that there are high-tech solutions other than vaccines. I'm just immensely proud of the work of Scott O'Neill, who's now Dean of Science at Monash University, and Ari Hoffman, who works right across here at Bio21, uh, with this control technology for dengue. Dengue is a mosquito-borne viral disease. It uh, has 50 to 100 million cases per year, and the carrier is Aedes aegypti. Well, Ari Hoffman isolated these Wolbachia bacteria from Drosophila, from fruit flies, and it was soon found that this harmless to man bacterium stops the mosquito from supporting and transmitting dengue. It, it shortens the lifespan of the mosquito just enough so that the virus can't complete its replication. They uh, found this strain, Mel, which had superior qualities, Mel for Melman, and they tried it first with caged mosquitoes, then through release of infected mosquitoes in the wild, two suburbs of Cairns. The Wolbachia spread rapidly th uh, through the population and they have just received all the approvals for field trials in the Vietnam, which will start soon and later in Thailand. But even more excitingly, I had the good fortune of having dinner with Scott O'Neill a few weeks ago and he said he's just got the Wolbachia into Anopheles 
which is, of course, the carrier of malaria. And while dengue is important, malaria is very more important. I can tell you, if this works for malaria, this is a Nobel Prize. I mean, this is big time. Particularly as the release has to happen only once, after which the bacteria spontaneously, as an infection, spread through uh, the mosquito population. So, ladies and gentlemen, the lecture's been a bit of politics and a bit of science, hopefully uh, a little bit of advocacy and hype too. And I wanted to finish by telling you what Peter Medawa said, the great father of transplantation biology and the co-Nobel Prize winner with Mac Burnett. If politics is the art of the possible, research is surely the art of the soluble. And he made the point that both are immensely practical-minded affairs. This is not airy-fairy stuff. This is practical stuff. But is it not fair that we should leave the very last word to the founder of immunology, Louis Pasteur, who said science knows no country because knowledge belongs to humanity and is the torch which illuminates the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gus, for that uh, brilliant presentation. You did exactly what you said you'd do, which was to uh, highlight the constraints we have, but also at the same time give us some hope and it's certainly incredibly motivating for those people that, that research infectious diseases. So I'll open it uh, to questions now. I want to just the, the, the big difference in the last timeline for TB elimination, one million cases in 2050 versus malaria, and no case in three years. Well, look, I think all of these aspirational goals are put up there by enthusiastic people, and uh, how much reality they have is a little bit doubtful. I guess tuberculosis has been a frustrating enemy. Frustrating enemy. Uh, I, I don't think there is any absolute reason uh, why it should be harder to conquer than malaria. Um, it also, one way or another, hasn't attracted the same glamour. You know, you have got Melinda Gates stamping around the world saying we've got to conquer malaria and putting lots and lots of money on the table. Uh, it's possible also that the traveller and the rich Western person doesn't feel as much threatened by tuberculosis because to catch tuberculosis from an open case, it usually means fairly close cohabitation. It usually happens within a household. Whereas a malarial mosquito can bite anyone. I had a, a distant acquaintance, not a friend, who uh, got bitten at an airport stopover in Johannesburg, South Africa, and died. That was the only exposure to malaria and mosquito. So I think that's part of the reason. So, Gus, you in a case like polio, it looks to be around Chad, you talked about five cases. What, what is thought to be the source of the well, with, with polio, we're in the fortunate situation that there is no animal reservoir and uh, there is no environmental re reservoir. I mean, we're never going to get rid of tetanus. We're never going to uh, get rid of cholera. Tetanus spores live in the ground for 50 years. Cholera lives freely in water. Uh, but polio lives only in human beings. And yes, there are allied and closely somewhat similar viruses, but they're not polio. So the only, so only way you can catch polio is from another polio victim. That's the only way you can catch it. Uh, what makes it more difficult than smallpox to eradicate is that there is a very high number of subclinical cases to clinical. With smallpox, you know, if you've got the crusty lesions, you know, you've got smallpox. Polio, there might be 100, there might even be 500 non-clinical cases for a big clinical one. Now, why did the polio get back into Chad? The answer to that is travel. You know, it had been eradicated, 
but there are imported cases. And uh, there have, in the you know, last dozen years or so, been quite a few imported cases. And it's actually quite amazing that there's only one country where the transmission has been newly established as a circulating thing and not by importation. Um, India is an interesting case in point. The last case of polio in India was on the 13th of January uh, <coughs> 2011. And lots of people, including D.A. Henderson, the eradicator of smallpox, said you'll never get rid of polio in India. You've got Bihar State and Uttar Pradesh up there in the north uh, near the Afghanistan border. So poor, so remote, some areas flooded for four months of the year, you'll never do it. But the Indians did it. They finally bit on the bullet. It's a newly, relatively rich country. They said, we'll do this bloody thing. And that's what Nigeria's got to do. Nigeria is the next biggest reservoir because there's 300 million people in Nigeria. And it's, it's got a hell of a lot to do with will and spending all of this money for something paradoxically which is not really a public health threat because the number of cases are so small. It's a, it's a nice little paradox. I'll ask you a question. How, how frustrating and how damaging is the anti-vaccine lobby in any attempt to eradicate or indeed control infectious diseases? Well, I'll tell you a beautiful story here. This is a real doozy. In 2009, somebody started spreading the rumour in Kano State of Nigeria that the uh, oral polio vaccine, the Sabin vaccine, was actually a Western plot to render Muslim girl babies sterile. I'll give you this here drop. I'm telling you it's going to control polio, but it's really to render you sterile. That got so much sway, including from politicians, that Nigeria essentially stopped, well, came very close to stopping immunization. And really wasn't until uh, the Pan-African League, or whatever they call their assembly of African states, finally persuaded them this was the most incredible amount of hogwash that they start immunizing again. So the anti-vaccine lobby is strong, it's powerful, it's persuasive. You see, we face it here in Australia, we face it in the rich countries. And most of the time, dare I say so, it doesn't matter that much because of herd immunity. So when you get 80 to 85 percent of people immunized, there's not enough soil for the virus or the bacterium to grow. But actually it does matter. There's a, a wonderful chap called David Salisbury who runs immunization in England. He was actually my successor as the chairman of this supervisory committee that you referred to. And he was on the cusp of eradicating measles from England. On the cusp. With the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. <coughs> and this would have been 10, 12 years ago. And then this wonderful chap called Andrew Wakefield comes around uh, with some flawed hybridization studies. He finds the measles virus in the lesions of um, Crohn's disease. Okay, he didn't know how to do hybridization. That someone found that out pretty quickly. So he said, oh, I didn't really mean Crohn's disease. I really meant autism. So the MMR caused autism. And this got so much publicity and got so much sway that the mums stopped using MMR. And a few of them said, no, we'll go back to the single measles and we'll get our mumps and rubella shots somehow differently or forget about those. And the coverage rates that David Salisbury had of something like 92% plummeted to under 70%. What was the result? Lots of lovely little measles outbreaks. And whereas you might think measles is a trivial disease, it is in most cases relatively trivial. It's a nasty disease. But, you know, uh, you do get measles encephalitis, you do get measles iritis in the eyes, you get measles pancreatitis. I mean, in the compendium, it's a nasty disease. And it's taken the UK over 10 years to recover from. So the anti-vaccine activists can do a lot of harm. And in my experience, all you really can do is reason quietly, quietly, never get annoyed, never get offended, 
to use sweet reason, and in particular point to these examples in the developing countries. You know, I think that graph with the mortality falling from 20 million kids to 8 million, it's a pretty powerful graph. Thanks uh, very much, guys. Please thank uh, Gus again for a wonderful